so in 2016, my mother had passed, but right before my mother had passed, my dad, uh, he was starting to forget things or if we spoke to him, he was beginning to continually ask you things. So it was definitely uh, signs that his short term memory wasn't so good. We had went on a cruise and on the cruise, it became evident we had had him tested when we came off that cruise and found he had a mild cognitive impairment. And then the doctor said that that may in eventually turn into uh, Alzheimer's as it progressed. So my mom eventually passed in 2016. Um, when my mother passed, then it was even more prominent and we, you know, now it was revealed that for the most part, my mother was serving as his memory. So she would help him remember things. And then my mother was in a wheelchair. So she was wheelchair bound. And my father pretty much was her mobility. It became more prevalent. It was more noticeable. Um, he couldn't remember, you know, he's always looking for my mother. Like, where's my wife? Where's Marie? What happened to her? I don't remember she died. You know, he said, Pop, she went to heaven. So <clears throat> now we would, uh, he was in North Carolina. So we would then spend about a month in North Carolina, a month here. And we did that for what, about a year? About a year back yeah. and forth, uh, keeping him with us. And, um, but again, the memory's still declining. We eventually uh, made the decision to bring him back to New York, you know, against his wishes, but he needed to be closer. So the compromise was to put him in assisted living. We had his own space, but we were always there. We were right there. So he was about 20 miles away from us and we would see him all the time. So that connectivity was there and he was able to you know have his own sense of this is my room this is my space you know that that it, it wasn't a, a a question it wasn't a conversation it was like okay this is pop this is what he needs and you know this is what we have to do you know we have to honor our mother and father so our days would be long in the land and you know we did it and we enjoyed doing it yeah, it was a lot you of fun. Know, we enjoyed it, and even as we don't do it now, it's like, wow, what do we do now? Because you know, we didn't even realize how much of our life was connected to, you know, just taking care, taking care of him, but taking care of him in a in a in a beautiful, flourishing, loving manner, you know. And it was a it was times we all enjoy. And, Every week we did something with him, whether we got him, we picked him up from the place and we brought him to the movies and we would go sit in the movies and get popcorn. He loves his M&Ms and Pepsi and we would take him to the movies and we would go. And that was weekly and weekly. We took him to a movie and dinner and or lunch. And this is fine restaurants, not McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. We got him dressed to the nines made him look sharp. And he sat there and ate his shrimp dinner, his uh, uh, whatever dinner that he wanted. And, and we took him to nice restaurants and um, we uh, took him out to this beautiful, all you can eat buffet for, remember for Christmas? And we mm -hmm. had him dressed in the black suit, the red yeah. and, his, and his beautiful uh, Christmas socks. Um, every, every holiday yeah. we made sure uh, we celebrated with him. With him. You know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, St. St. Patty's Day, <laughs> Halloween, and not just celebrated, but you know, he had the green fedora <laughs> on for St. Patrick's Day and his, you know, green necklace and his costume, Spider Man costume for Halloween. you know, Halloween. <laughs> and so whatever the event was, he was dressed for it. They had a prom. Uh, and he had on his uh, tuxedos. Ooh, and sharp. We got dressed up in our tuxedos, and everyone was sharp. And 
family came and he uh, won, he won the prom uh, king uh, for best dress. Uh, we would all, you know, he loved to dance, so we would make sure he would dance, um, play music, you know, like we would also tell the staff, if he give you problems, just put on some James Brown and that's going to get him alert, you know, and it worked. Or if, if he was depressed, play uh, Whitney Houston's, what's the song? I Love the Lord. I Love the Lord. Because the staff knew that we were always there, they took more interest in him and made sure that I believe they gave him a higher level of care because they knew all right, the Coopers are coming <laughs> and you don't want to upset them. So they made sure he was clean, he was sharp. He would, you know, like, don't let him sleep in his clothes, put his pajamas on. And because they did that, we uh, one time decided, you know what, we're going to give them, we're going to show them their appreci our appreciation for them, especially during COVID. We took our double burner <laughs> gas grill and stuffed it in the van and we have like the uh the, the handicap van where there's no middle seat because it was for my mom and we put that in there and got some fish and hot dogs and burgers salad. potato salad macaroni salad yeah, soda, soda cake <laughs> nice staff appreciation cake and just went out there unloaded the truck in the grass and everyone came out in their masks and you know we was like what do you want what do you want and just cook the food right there for them during COVID he didn't understand like where are y'all when you coming uh come on get here I'm waiting for you and oh my god we used to feel so bad because one we couldn't see him he couldn't see us and I know that that play that had a, a real harsh mental impact like for not just him for us and i think for the other residents too mm -hmm. whose whose families you know were, were disconnected and weren't able to you know see their loved ones for my mother just i took on a caregiving role for my mother as well and she was at end stage lung cancer um and she already made her wishes known that you know she didn't want to uh go to a facility she wanted to be at home for her final days um so lisa and i had a discussion i said lisa now i want to move in with my mom and be there for her and take care of her in her end days and lisa being supportive of me uh, let me do that and, and that's what um we did for her for her last like maybe a month and a half of her life the first thing to do is just know your resources know what you're dealing with first of all you you got to want to do it. You got to feel not like an obligation, but just something that's part of your DNA. It's just something that you want to do. Prepare yourself that that's your loved one, your mother, your father, your wife, your husband. And you're going to do whatever it can take to make their time on this earth, whether it's the next month, whether it's the next three years, the next 10 years, happy as it can be and safe. And you also know that you need some mental health breaks for yourself. Um, what I would do is like on the weekend, I would call a friend of mine and I'd actually pay her. And I'd say, look, I need eight hours when I was at my mother's house um, being her caregiver. And I said, I want to go home and spend some time with Lisa. I need a, I need a break, you know, because caregiving in that situation is a 24 hour job. So she would go watch my mom. I would come home and I would just spend time with Lisa. We'd get in the pool or just woosah, you know what I mean? And just spend some time with each other. Cause, so, cause you also know that in this process, you also have to take care of yourself. You have to make sure you're eating. You have to make sure that you're taking care of your, your psychological, emotional needs as well, because it can get very, very overwhelming, especially if you're in a situation where you see someone's near end of life and you know that every minute with them is, is precious because you don't know how many more minutes you're going to have and you have to do everything. It, it, it can get a little overwhelming emotionally and physically so you learn to just pace yourself be okay to know that you need a time out and need a break take that break and uh get yourself right and just make sure you have a support system around you because even though you're caregiving you still need someone to care for you and uh 
and don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel that you, you know, need to, you don't have to be a hero. You know, you, 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 you if you feel sad, move out the room and cry and you know, get the cry out. If you feel overwhelmed, go leave the room and go scream. And, you know, but, but you need to, you know, take care of yourself so that you don't run yourself down in the process. My dad and I, like, I was frustrated, like, all right, we would get into it. And sometimes Val had to say, look, that's not him. That's the disease talking. So you have to do that. Um, and I would tell them to have the conversations with the person that they're taking care of for end of life. Because, you know, it's like, okay, what do you want? Do you want to be resuscitated? Do you not want to be resuscitated? Do you, you know, want to be intubated? Like, what are your in the life um, wishes? Because that becomes a big, heavy weight on a caregiver. You have to know when to stop being a caregiver, you know, because as my mom went in the hospice with cancer, she um died what she was in hospice what 48 hours 24 hours yeah. and um everything about my thinking was like all right give her her vitamins do this do this do this you know she's she's give her her meds do this do this which i didn't know and my thing is like let's do everything to keep her living but that's not what hospice was about it was like let's do everything to keep them comfortable until they die and now as I have went through it, after, you know, I first had to resolve myself as a caregiver to let that process take place. But as I went through it with my dad and I was glad, and even though it took me a couple of days, you know, at the hospice facility for them to really say, well, no, this is not what we do. And then when I finally said, okay, I understand and do what you guys have to do. Keep him comfortable. Don't let him suffer. Even though I feel we both did everything possible, everything that we could do, but there's still that guilt associated with it. When do you let go and just let them die peacefully and gracefully? Or when do you keep trying to intervene and, you know, be intrusive and you know, try to keep them going and for what, to whose benefit? Mm. To my benefit, to her benefit, but not necessarily to their benefit. I would tell whoever, not just the caretaker, but the caretaker's partner, whoever they are. And the partner really have to be supportive because you don't ever want your partner to feel like they have to choose between you and their parent or you and their loved one. And it's like, oh, you don't have time for me or, oh, mm -hmm. um, you ain't here and I'm going to, you know, like you don't want that resentment. Like they really have to be fully invested with the partner too, because you know what? Today is me. Tomorrow it could be you or it could be my loved one today. It could be your loved one tomorrow. And, you know, at the end of the day, you just have to treat people the way you want to be treated. And that support is phenomenal. Um, and I could not have done the, the, the care of my parents or myself without her support. And, you know, when I, 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 I like to believe that when her mom and brother and father passed, you know, that I was that same uh, support. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely.